Okay, this is a lecture about um, membrane structure and passive transport. So um, the beginning of this should be review for you. We're going to start with the structure of cell membranes. Uh, remember that cell membranes are made up of phospholipid bilayers. Um, a bilayer, a bilayer means two layers, and there are phospholipids with hydrophilic heads, which means they're polar and attracted to water, and hydrophobic tails, which are repelled by water. And so the um, phospholipids, if there are many of them in a watery environment, will form two layers with the tails away from the water and the heads towards the water. So there will be water on the outside of the cell and water on the inside of the cell. Uh, the cell membranes and the membranes surrounding the organelles in all eukaryotic cells have phospholipid bilayers around them. And again, just a, a repeat that the heads are polar and the tails are nonpolar. And because the heads are polar, they're attracted to water and therefore referred to as hydrophilic because water is polar too. And so charged molecules will be attracted to other charged molecules. And the nonpolar fatty acid tails are hydrophobic and nonpolar and therefore repelled from the polar charged particles of water. Notice in the diagram that every phospholipid has two fatty acid tails. This will be important for um, lab reports. Phospholipid bilayers are semi-permeable. Another way to say that is selectively permeable and only allow certain molecules to pass in or out of a cell. The size and charge of the molecule that needs to get across the membrane will determine if it can cross and if it does cross, how it gets across. So let's look a little more and a little more closely at the structure. So there are globular proteins, which refers to the shape of a protein. And the globular proteins may have different jobs. Here you can see some of the proteins just are on the outside. Um, and some go all the way through. This is a carrier protein or a transport protein. They are the same thing. I have many students that say, what's the difference between a transport protein and a carrier protein? There is no difference. It's just two different ways to say the same thing. Um, and one common misconception about transport proteins is that they transport proteins. They don't. They are proteins whose job it is to transport other types of molecules across the cell. Trans uh, Proteins are enormous and really couldn't get across a cell unless they were using active transport. And active transport typically wouldn't go through a protein channel. Um, another type of protein in here is this glycoprotein, and it has carbohydrate side chain on it. And its job is for cell-to-cell -cell communication and recognizing that there is a, another cell nearby. And they even look like antenna. So again, the globular carrier proteins are involved in transporting molecules across the membrane, and these guys are for communication. Cholesterol is found between the lipid molecules, and it improves the stability of the membrane and also decreases permeability, which seems like it would be a bad thing, but remember, you want permeability to be um, not, you want molecules to get through, but not every molecule to get through, so you want the permeability to permeability to be just right. Um, some students say, well, I thought cholesterol is bad for us, so why do we have cholesterols in our cell membranes if it's bad for us? Our body makes all the cholesterol we need. We do not need it in our diet, and too much cholesterol um, can perhaps build up in our um, arteries and veins and cause blockages. Just a quick reminder that all cells have a membrane, at least around the outside. All eukaryotic cells not only have a cell membrane, but membrane surrounded organelles, and many of them. Bacterial cells still have a cell membrane, um, but no membrane bound organelles inside, and they have DNA, but the DNA is not separated by a nuclear membrane. Um, and most cells also have a cell wall on the outside of the cell membrane, including fungi, bacteria, and plants, and algae. Animal cells are one of the few types of cells that do not have a cell wall. And remember that not all cell walls are made of the same material. Plant cells have cell walls made of cellulose, which is a complex carbohydrate, but these other, molecule, these other types of cells um, do not have uh, cellulose cell walls. Um, just really quickly going back to which molecules can cross, where we talk about size and charge, small 
and nonpolar molecules like carbon dioxide and oxygen can get right through the phospholipids. Um, if a molecule is slightly larger, like a medium-sized molecule like glucose or amino acid, if it's medium-sized, it would need a slightly larger opening and it would go through a carrier protein. Also, if a molecule is polar, like water or glucose, and is some of the 20 amino acids, even if it was small enough, like water is only three atoms large, it would have to go through a transport protein because of the hydrophobic tails. Um, very large molecules would need active transport. So again, medium-sized molecules, polar molecules, and charged ions would need a carrier protein, and then small and nonpolar molecules, it would need to be both small and nonpolar and not an ion, would be able to get right through phospholipids. And we focus on oxygen and carbon dioxide because they're really important for photosynthesis and cellular respiration, which our next two units are going to be involved with. All right, so now let's talk about passive transport. With passive transport, no energy is required, uh, which means the cell doesn't need to use ATP. Remember that if the cell is going to do any work, ATP will be used. Um, the most basic type of passive transport is referred to as diffusion. And diffusion is the movement of suspended molecules from high to low concentration. It may be in a cell, but diffusion occurs even if you don't have a cell. If somebody sprays perfume in the air, those perfume molecules will diffuse throughout the air and spread out due to random molecular motion and um, increasing entropy. So again, particles constantly are moving and collide with each other and spread out randomly, and that's why diffusion will occur. So oxygen and CO2, which are small and uncharged, would diffuse right across the lipid bilayer, right between the phospholipids, because they're super small. Carbon dioxide is only three atoms, and oxygen molecules are two oxygen atoms bonded together, so they're super small. And there is not even a partial charge and not a polar, uh, polarity of those molecules. So with facilitated diffusion, uh, molecules like water, amino acids, simple sugars like glucose, and ions would need help across the membrane. And that's why it's called facilitated. Facilitated means sort of like assisted diffusion. And they would go through protein channels. And those molecules have their own protein channels that are specific for the type of molecule. Um, aquaporins transport water because water is polar. Glucose, even if it wasn't polar, would probably be too large to get right through phospholipids. Remember, C6H12O6, right? That's 24 atoms versus three atoms in a water molecule. Um, but glucose is also slightly polar. Um, be careful not to refer to polar molecules as charged or ions as polar. Remember, an ion is an atom that's lost or gained electrons, so it has a complete charge. Um, and it's usually an atom, although there are some polyatomic ions, or ions made of a couple atoms bonded together. Um, remember that molecules that are polar haven't gained or lost electrons. They have an equal number of protons and electrons, but the charge is not evenly spread out in the within the molecule. And this is still passive transport, and it's still molecules or atoms going from high to low concentration. Sometimes students think facilitated diffusion is a type of active transport. It is not. Still no energy is used. Molecules are still going from high to low concentration. In other words, where there is more of them to where there is less of them. So osmosis is actually just a special type of facilitated diffusion, and it's only special because it's the motion of water. And we care a lot about water in cells uh, because water is very important for cells, but it is really no different in terms of what happens than when you're talking about the facilitated diffusion of glucose. There's just obviously more water than glucose in any cell. Um, so osmosis is the diffusion of water from high water concentration to lower water concentration. In other words, from where there is more water to where there is less water until the water concentrations and solute concentrations are equal on both sides of a membrane. So if you look at this diagram, 
On the right side of the membrane, there are more solute particles, and on the left side, there are fewer solute particles. And really, we're thinking about concentration, so we're thinking about the ratio of solute to solvent. And in biology, the solvent is always water because cells are full of water. Um, in chemistry, the solvent is often water, but not always. So if you notice that, we'll go back and do that again, you'll see that since there's more free water on this side, more water is going from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen, but there's that water molecule going left. So generally we talk about the flow of water and we are, are sort of understanding that it is a net flow of water. More water went this way, less water went that way. So you don't even really count the water that's going this way since more goes left to right. So why does this happen? So osmosis is the movement of free water molecules across a semi-permeable membrane until equilibrium is reached. So the blue particles are water molecules and the red particles are solute particles. And sometimes students get solution and solute con uh, confused. And just sort of to review or to introduce these terms for, th um, for the first time, a solution um, has a solute and a solvent. The solvent is what is dissolving the solute. And in our case, the solvent will always be water and the solute will be dissolved in the water. So sometimes it's sodium or chlorine ions from like salt or sometimes it's sugar particles. Um, but solute is dissolved in the solvent and the solution includes both of those two. So the dotted line in the middle of the screen represents a semi-permeable membrane. And in this scenario, water can pass, but the solute cannot. Sometimes the solute can go across a semi-permeable membrane in the opposite direction of the water, but in this particular case, we're assuming it doesn't because generally the size is too big. So solutes dissolved, dissolve in water because they're attracted to water molecules. So you can see in this diagram, each of the solute molecules has five water molecules stuck to it. So the more solute you have, in the solution, the more water will be stuck to solute particles. So on this side, we only have two solute particles. So on the left side, there's more free water than there is on the right side. So free water will move in both directions, but most of the movement will be from high to low concentration of free water. So from where there is more free water towards where there is less free water. And then the volume will change. Because water is moving from left to right, the volume on the right side increases and the volume on the left side decreases until equilibrium has been reached and the concentrations now are equal. The amount of solute hasn't changed. The concentration of the solute has though. So now let's talk about three types of solutions. We have isotonic solutions. Um, an isotonic solution has the same amount of dissolved substances that there is on the inside of the cell. So in an isotonic solution, the cell is already in equilibrium. Sometimes students have a hard time understanding what's the difference between isotonic and equilibrium and when should I use those um, terms. So isotonic is the term that we use to describe the solution outside the cell. And then the situation that the cell is in, you would refer to the cell as being in equilibrium with the solution that it is in. Not much will change if you put a cell in an isotonic solution. A little bit of water will go in, a little bit of water will go out. But there's no really net change of flow and not much will happen to the cell. In a hypotonic solution, um, you have less solute outside the cell. And if you have less solute outside the cell, you necessarily have more water, right? So if there's less solute, there is therefore more water outside of the cell. Hypo means less. Tonic does not mean water. Tonic means solute. So less solute is what hypotonic means. And again, less solute it also therefore has to mean more water. And if there is more water outside the cell, water will go into the cell and osmosis occurs. So if it is a plant cell and it gains water, 
the turgor pressure will increase and the cell will expand and swell, but it can't burst because the cell wall prevents that. In an animal cell, if water rushes in, it can burst. It doesn't always, it just depends on the differences in the concentration of water on the inside and the outside. But if it does, the terminology for bursting due to water going into an animal cell is cytolysis. Animal cells are not the only ones that this happens to, but there are some protozoans like the amoeba, euglena, and paramecium that you have pictures of on your flashcards when you were learning about pseudopodia and cilia and flagella. Um, those guys can also burst and swell. They have ways not to since they live in pond water, but they theoretically could burst. Anything with a cell wall can't. So a fungus or a bacterial cell, they cannot burst. A hypertonic solution is the opposite. So hyper means more and tonic means solute. So if there is more solute, there is therefore proportionally less water. And if there is less water outside the cell, then water will leave the cell. And if it is an animal cell or a protozoan or any cell that does not have a cell wall, the entire cell shrinks. Um, that vocabulary word, it's not on the screen, is crenation, and it's spelled C-R-E-N-A-T-I-O-N. If it happens to a plant cell, the whole cell itself can't shrink because the cell wall can't change shape. Cellulose is very rigid. And this is actually true for any type of cell that has a cell wall. Cell walls in general are rigid and so therefore they don't change shape. But what can happen is the cytoplasm within the cell can shrink away from the cell wall, bringing the cell membrane with it. So you can't see it here, but there is cell membrane all around the edges of the cytoplasm. And when the cytoplasm shrinks, it's referred to as plasmolysis. You've seen the um, part of the word lysis many times. You've seen lysosomes and hydrolysis in previous units. Um, so anything where you see lysis, it means destruction. And on the previous slide, when we had cytolysis, cyto means cell, lysis means destruction. So in this case, the whole cell is destroyed. And in this case, just the cytoplasm is destroyed. So take a few minutes to do these review questions and hit pause on your video and answer these questions before um, you just listen to the answers. Studying the answers without thinking about them doesn't really help you review. All right, so membranes are made up of phospholipid bilayers. Membranes are flexible, constantly moving, and have proteins, cholesterol, and other compounds floating within them. This is known as the fluid mosaic model. Which type of transport requires no energy to be used? That would be passive transport. Diffusion is when particles move from high to low concentration. Osmosis is when water particles move from high to low concentration across a cell membrane uh, through aquaporins. Um, and that's a special, well, it's not really a special type of facilitated diffusion, it's just the facilitated diffusion of water through an aquaporin. Now, just a few um, common misconceptions I want to discuss uh, before we attempt these three problems. First of all, sometimes students don't understand that osmosis can occur in either direction. If you have water crossing a membrane, it's osmosis, whether water is entering the cell or whether water is leaving the cell. Um, hypertonic and hypotonic are not verbs, so you can't say hypertonic happens or hypotonic happens. Those terms are terms that are used to describe a solution outside a cell. Now, sometimes students try to start to discuss uh, the, ter the, the concentration of the solution inside the cell and compare it to the outside of the cell. So they'll say that the fluid inside the cell is hyper or hypotonic compared to the outside. It's not really wrong, it's just not usually really done that way. When we use the terms isotonic and hypertonic and hypotonic, we are referring to the solutions outside of the cell. So, um, in this particular first scenario, if you have 10% salt solution outside the cell and 2% salt solution inside the cell, um, you would say that the solution is outside the cell is hypertonic because hyper means more, tonic means solute. So there is more solute outside than inside. 10% um, is greater than 2%. So 
So then you have to figure out which way will the water go. And before you can do that, you have to figure out how much water is on the outside of the cell versus the inside of the cell. Well, if this is 10% salt, that means it's 90% water. And if this is 2% salt, that means it's 98% water. 98% water is greater than 90% water. Water will go from high water concentration to lower water concentration. But sometimes students think, oh, um, water goes from high to low concentration, and they start to think that that high to low concentration is in reference to the solute concentration, and it's not. Water goes from where there is more water to where there is less water, so from 98% to 90% water. So water exits the cell. In this case, we have 2% salt solution, which is 98% water, 10% salt on the inside, 90% water. So in this case, since 2% is less than 10%, it is a hypotonic solution outside the cell. And in that case, water will enter the cell because 98% water is greater than 90% water. And in this final scenario, the concentration of solute and solvent are both equal. So the solution outside the cell is referred to as isotonic, and the cell is already in equilibrium. So there will be no net flow of water. Some water will go in and some water will go out, but it will be equal. A little bit going in and a little bit going out.